So today we're here to talk about Sukkot. Show of hands, who has heard of Sukkot before this service? Okay, that's more than I expected. So, <laughs> uh, but I think you use are generally a little more educated about world religions. So, <laughs> um, so today Sukkot, uh, Sukkot begins at sundown tonight. Uh, at sundown tonight it will be the 15th day of the month of Tishrei. And Sukkot is part of the larger holiday season of the Jewish people uh, that falls during the month of Tishrei. So it begins on the first with Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Ten days later, we have the Day of Atonement. And then five days after that, we have this week-long festival celebrating the harvest, which is called Sukkot. And so today, because most of you don't know about this holiday, I have to tell you sort of where it came from, what we do to celebrate it, and then sort of what significance can it have for us? Whether you're Jewish or not, whether you celebrate the holiday or not, what, what significance does it have? And so Sukkot began as a harvest festival for the ancient Israelites, three, more than 3,000 years ago probably. And essentially what they would do is they go out in their fields, they're harvesting, they build these huts to live in while they're out there, and it just became a time of rejoicing like it always did uh, in every culture. And when the Torah was being written and redacted and edited and re-edited, uh, it, the commandment to celebrate this holiday was incorporated into the Torah. And so there are two places that it's commanded. The first is in Exodus and the second is in Leviticus. The command from Exodus is very spare. It just says, you shall observe the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Doesn't really tell you much. Um, but Leviticus goes on a bit repetitively, and I'm sorry, but it's the Bible. And, uh, uh, and it gives a lot more detail about what you're supposed to do. And it's from Leviticus chapter 23. And it says, On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in, in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of Yahweh seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when, they, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So what this shows us is if you didn't catch it from the repetition, you have to dwell on a booth for seven days. <laughs> and you have to celebrate with these sticks and fruit and you know, what are, what are you supposed to do with them? Uh, so the, the Talmud goes into a lot more detail about what you're supposed to do with all this stuff. <clears throat> and, you'll, and you can see from this passage that it's both a harvest festival, which is the sort of natural origin of it, but it was given a theological importance, which was it's a memorial of the wandering in the desert for 40 years. Sukkot was the most important holiday in ancient Israel and Judea um, until essentially they were cast out. And it was so important that the rabbis of the Talmud simply referred to it as the holiday. Like, it is the holiday. It's, it was sort of the equivalent of important, in importance that Christmas has in America today. It's the holiday. But Obviously, most of us don't really know or haven't heard of it if we're not Jewish or Jewish adjacent. And so, <laughs> uh, but this holiday is so important that it's actually spun off two holidays. We talked about the first one uh, with the kids, which was Thanksgiving. That was the first, that's one of the holidays that spun off of Sukkot. But the second one that a lot of people don't know is Hanukkah. So, Hanukkah is actually uh, just a sort of a re-celebration of Sukkot because the Maccabees were all fighting their war. They couldn't celebrate the holiday properly when they were all fighting their war. And so when they got back two, three months later, whatever it was, they said, oh, well, we'll go ahead and we've rededicated the temple and now we're going to have a second Sukkot. And the, they just called the holiday Hanukkah, which means dedication. And so it's so important that it spun off two holidays already. So now that we have some of the history of it, where it comes from, we have to talk about sort of the ways that it's celebrated. And essentially, there are two ways 
there are two elements to this holiday. There's the sukkah, and there's the lulav and etrog. Um, we're going to talk about the sukkah first, and then we'll go to the lulav and etrog. So the sukkah is a temporary booth. It's a hut. It's supposed to be temporary, has to be temporary to be kosher, and it has to have at least two and a half walls. It can have four walls, but it has to have at least two and a half, and the roof is made of branches, and it has to be very particular branches, and the roof has to cast more shade than it lets in light, but at night, you should be able to see the stars through the roof. Um, it's the, the point is that it's temporary and it's not sufficient, um, and we're going to get into that later. And people usually will do huge, elaborate, you can make it very sparse and simple, um, or you can make it this elaborate, beautiful, decorated booth where you can just go out and celebrate the, the holiday with your family. And, oh, interesting thing about the walls. One of the, wall, one of the walls can be part of an existing structure, so you can build it like adjacent to your house. But one of the walls could also be the broad side of an elephant. Uh, that was something that... <laughs> The, the rabbis thought that was important to put in there. Um, and so, uh, like we talked about just a second ago, in traditional Judaism, it's taught that the sukkah is reminiscent of the booths that the Israelites dwelt in in the desert when they left Egypt. Um, but this is just clearly not true um, because the Israelites never wandered in the desert for 40 years. The exodus didn't happen. Uh, archaeologists have there's no evidence of it. There's no historical evidence. There's no archaeological evidence. And the, the information from the story would have millions of people leaving Egypt so that the first people would be arriving in Israel as the last people were walking out, um, if they were walking in a line. Um, and so we know that it's not true. It's a sort of later justification that was given by the Torah writers. Um, in all likelihood, these booths were just the things that farmers built so they could get out of the midday sun. Because if you uh, in the Mediterranean, midday sun can be pretty harsh, um, and so what they would do is they build these huts. They would take their lunch and their siesta there. They might even sleep there overnight if they didn't want to walk back to their village from the farm. And so <clears throat> that's more more than likely where the sukkah actually comes from. And according to Jewish law, you're required to eat your meals in the sukkah, um, and that fulfills the the qualification of dwelling and the sukkah for seven days. is If you eat your meals, then you've dwelt in that sukkah. Um, some people will actually sleep in it. They'll camp out in their sukkah with their kids it's, uh, if the weather is good enough. And another uh, part of the, the celebrations is this tradition called Ushpizin. And this comes from the Kabbalah. And essentially what you do is you invite seven guests into your Sukkah, and these are not real guests, they're symbolic, they're from the Jewish tradition. And each of these guests teaches a special spiritual lesson for that day. And the traditional guests are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joseph, and David. Because, and the reason that these seven were chosen is because each of them in his wanderings contributed to the world through a personal characteristic that they had. So. Abraham represents loving kindness. Isaac is strength. Jacob is splendor. Um, Moses is glory. Aaron is holiness. Joseph is eternity. And David represents sovereignty. Uh, as you noticed, most of the, all of them are men. And um, because traditional Judaism is fairly patriarchal. Um, but liberal Jews, the like Reform and Reconstructionists and conservative Jews, they have begun a, a tradition of inviting uh, female guests from the Jewish tradition, and they've chosen the seven uh, female prophets that were named in the, the, the Hebrew Bible. And these are Sarah, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, Abigail, Hulda, and Esther. I couldn't find what they're supposed to represent, but I assume it's probably going to be the same thing as the men. <clears throat> And so this brings us to the second element of the holiday that we celebrate with, which is the lulav and etrog. And I don't know if all of you could see that. Some of you saw it because your kids were coloring it in. But this is sort of a, an artistic rendering <laughs> of a lulav and etrog. So you take three types of branches and you bind them together in a very specific way. And it's a palm branch, myrtle, and willow. And then you also have this etrog, which uh, is a citrus that's native to the land of Israel. 
and <clears throat> you hold them together and you wave them in six directions. You start with the east and then you go south, west, north, and then you wave them up and then you wave them down. And then no one really knows why we do this. Uh, <laughs> it's tradition. Um, but, you know, we also come up with reasons for it. And some, some people say that it's to symbolize that God is everywhere and that God is the source of all life. And therefore, God is the source of the harvest and the rain and everything that comes from the land. Uh, more, I guess, academically, less religiously minded people say that it's just an ancient form of sympathetic magic. So you're shaking these branches. They're making sound that sounds like rain and that is sort of enticing the rain to come um, and fall. Because in Israel, um, the yearly rains come in the winter. They come after this holiday. They pretty much start after Sukkot, and they run through the winter until spring at Passover. Um, and then, so um, this is essentially just a way to sort of, we want rain, God give us rain. Um, and this sort of change in the weather is also reflected in the daily prayers of the Jewish people. So during the winter, we pray we, we, we thank God for sending the rain, and then in the, the spring and the summer, we thank God for sending the dew, the morning dew, um, because we know it's not going to rain. <clears throat> and so the holiday ends after seven days. On the eighth day, as you, you might have, when you were listening to the, the Bible reading, it says you celebrate the holiday for seven days, and then on the eighth day, you have a day of rest. So this eighth day is a separate holiday. It's called Shemini Atzeret. It's basically just a day that you don't work. There's nothing really associated with it. Um, in the last two or 300 years, there has begun a tradition of celebrating that day as Simchat Torah. It's a, so it's a sort of double holiday. And Simchat Torah just celebrates the completion of the Torah reading cycle. And so we finish Deuteronomy, and we immediately begin over in Genesis. And uh, well, it's sort of... They do it symbolically in the synagogue where they'll literally just read the last like, line of De Deuteronomy and then they'll immediately sort of start rolling the scroll back to get to Genesis or they'll have a second scroll ready and then they'll read the first line of Genesis. And some synagogues will actually unroll the entire Torah scroll around the sanctuary and people will be standing with gloves to sort of hold it up as it's unrolled. And this is supposed to represent that the Torah embraces everyone. It embraces the whole Jewish people and holds us together. So why, do you, why, why should you care? Uh, <laughs> um, essentially. Um, so most of us aren't farmers. We're not, we don't care about the harvest all that much. The only time we really care is if the food isn't there. Um, and so, and then, you know, as I pointed out earlier, archaeologists and historians have repeatedly shown that there's really no evidence for the exodus or the wandering in the desert. And so it probably almost likely did not happen. Or if it did happen, it was a very small group of maybe a couple hundred. It wasn't the millions that the Torah describes. And so this makes Sukkot uh, pretty irrelevant to most Jewish people, uh, in America at least. In Israel, it's a very popular holiday. Um, <clears throat> You know why should why why should we celebrate a holiday where none of it is <laughs> matters to us, and so what significance can we find in this holiday? Um, Rabbi Sherwin Wein, we've heard a couple of readings from him this morning. Uh, he founded humanistic Judaism, which is the denomination of Judaism that I practice, and so he his thing was making making sure that Jewish traditions are relevant to people who don't believe in the traditional theology, who don't believe that the Torah is literally the divine word of God, and, or don't even believe in God. And so in his sort of magnum opus called Jude it's entitled Judaism Beyond God, he confronts this issue of relevance for modern Jews who no longer believe. And he argued that Sukkot as a celebration of the harvest is by extension a celebration of agriculture. And agriculture was the beginning of human civilization. It coincided with permanent settlements, which led to cities, nations, population growth, surplus wealth, technological advancement, and of course, written language. So what a happy coincidence that the holiday culminates with a hol another holiday focused on scripture. 
Um, so agriculture can represent the human will to live and thrive in spite of overwhelming odds and the capricious forces of nature. And this is achieved through intelligence, hard work, and of course, cooperation. So what Wine said was that Sukkot can be a celebration of all human cultural achievements, not just the harvest. And as important as the harvest may be, it can be everything that we have produced as human beings. And it's a celebration of the power of humanity to work together and solve problems to provide food, medicine, housing, education, and all the other wonderful things in life, like music and art. But as we all know, human history isn't really that rosy of a picture. Uh, the advance of civilization was not pleasant for most people. There was, there was surplus wealth, that's true, but only a very tiny portion of the population actually benefited from that. Even today, wealth, education, health care, and food are not equitably distributed or available. And uh, let's not forget that the vast majority of people in history have been forced to cooperate by, exploita by exploitative hierarchies and the threat of violence. Civilization, by and large, has been built on the backs of slaves and the poor. And this is why I think that the rituals associated with Sukkot are so important. We spend a week symbolically living in a flimsy shelter. It can't even keep out the rain, and it might blow over in a strong gust. A shelter that could be missing up to one and a half walls. Its roof is made out of branches, and the walls are usually made out of some type of cloth. If you live in a, if you live in a cool climate like Eastern Europe, um, it can be really cold eating your meals and sleeping in the sukkah at this time of year. And it truly is a dwelling that you would expect for a bunch of runaway slaves. It, it's part of what makes it such a powerful symbol for the holiday. So we temporarily give up the comforts of modern life and symbolically live in a hut, and this reminds us of the difficulties of poverty. And it's for this reason that we perform the ritual of inviting in guests, symbolically guests, symbolic guests, but not just symbolic guests. Our sages encouraged us to invite the poor to eat with us in the sukkah. And some rabbis even said that only the sukkah in which poor people are invited and find an open table will the, the ushpizin, the symbolic guest, come. They're not going to come if you're not taking care of the poor. In fact, according to a midrash, nothing in the world is worse than poverty. It's considered the worst thing that, could, that can befall a person. And poverty outweighs all the sufferings of the, other, of the world put together. I'm not sure that I agree with that hyperbole. I think there might be some other things that might be worse. Um, but concern for the poor and downtrodden is one of the central concerns of Judaism. It's central to the ethics of Judaism. And it runs through the Hebrew Bible, the Talmud, and all subsequent writings on Jewish law, folklore, and theology. To be a religious Jew requires that you care for those who are less fortunate than yourself. The lulav and etrog um, can also have a new meaning. So the branches and the fruit can represent our connection to and our dependence on the natural world. They literally represent the land. They can act as a reminder of the fragility of the environment that surrounds us, uh, the fact that we are not separate from the environment. While we, have, while we may have a greater mastery over the natural world than our ancestors, our mastery is not absolute. We are still dependent on the earth, the rain, the sun, and all living things. Waving the lulav and etrog around us, as silly as it may feel, can remind us that we are surrounded by and a part of an interdependent web of all existence. East, south, west, north, up, and down. And so I think this is the central teaching of Sukkot. Yes, we can achieve a lot through intelligence and cooperation and a healthy dose of luck, but without love, compassion, equity, and justice, those achievements don't mean anything. They don't mean anything to the slave. They don't mean anything to the person that's been trafficked. They don't mean anything to the person who can't afford to go to a doctor because of a profit-driven healthcare system. They don't mean anything to the person who doesn't have adequate food or a home. We not only must work together, we must work together for the benefit of all people because all people have inherent worth. In a society with an extreme surplus of wealth like ours, no person should be denied the basic goods and services that they need just to live. In order to have a world community with peace, liberty, and justice, as our sixth principle states, 
we must recognize that all the wonderful, bountiful harvests that are created by society belong to everyone in that society. In order to respect the worth of every person, to uphold the principles of compassion, equity, and justice, the goods of society should be available to all. And so I'm going to end my sermon with a reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58. This is usually read on Yom Kippur, but I think it's appropriate here as well. This is the fast that I desire, to unlock the fetters of wickedness and untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. It is to share your bread with the hungry and to take the wretched poor into your home when you see the naked to clothe him and not to ignore your own people. If you banish the yoke from your midst, the menacing hand and evil speech, and you offer your compassion to the hungry and satisfy the famished creature, then shall your light shine in the darkness and your gloom shall be, be like noonday. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring whose waters do not fail. We have a responsive reading in our bulletin, if you would join me. And this is a reflection on the meaning of the Lulav and Etrog written by Rabbi Jeff Fallick. The Lulav palm frond, standing true and strong, resembles the spine of a person. Let us stand straight with honesty and strength. Adorning the Lulav frond are three sprigs of myrtle, shaped like eyes. Two willow branches decorate it too. They remind us of human lips. Let us use our words for good, to teach and encourage, uplift and build. The etrog calls to mind the human heart, poetic source of love and tenderness. Let us be guided by love in all things and loving kindness right our way. We are in possession of a harvest of honesty, strength, awe, encouragement, and loving kindness. Let us share in our bounty.